In this session, we want to study the prophetic dimension or the prophetic significance of the book of Esther. And basically, I want to review the historical context of the story of Esther as it applies to history, and then we're going to take a look at the historical context as it applies to prophecy. You remember that God's people were in captivity from the year 605 till the year 539 BC. In the year 539, Babylon received a deadly wound by the Medes and the Persians. Then there were some decrees given in the year 536 and in the year 520, giving God's people civil and religious liberty to reestablish their religion. But we notice that in the year 480, the same kingdom which gave the decree of civil and religious liberty now withdrew the right to civil and religious liberty and God's people faced a death decree. Now we notice that there's a parallel to this in the end time. God's spiritual Israel were captive to spiritual Babylon during a period of 1260 years from 538 to 1798. In 1798 spiritual Babylon received a deadly wound and the ki there was a kingdom that arose, the United States of America who in its constitution, in the first amendment in fact to the constitution guaranteed for God's people civil and religious liberty to preach the truth of God without persecution. It's interesting to notice that the Medes and the Persians, that kingdom was represented as a ram having two horns. In other words, one kingdom having two kingdoms, or one nation having two kingdoms. In the same way in Revelation 13 the United States is represented by one beast which has two horns like a lamb. Those two horns represent civil and religious liberty, the civil and the religious kingdom if you please, that are to remain separate from one another. And as a result of this we find that God's people have been able to proclaim the message of God, reestablish the truth of God, with full civil and religious liberty. But as in the days of Esther, the same kingdom that guaranteed civil and religious liberty to reestablish the truth, later removed it and brought about a death decree, so the United States who guaranteed civil and religious liberty, the Bible says that will, it will end up speaking as a dragon. In other words, civil and religious liberty will be removed in the future. As in the days of Esther, in the end time there will be certain protagonists in this story. We find first of all the dragon. The dragon represents the civil powers of the world, represents the political powers of the world. Then we have a religious coalition between the beast and the false prophet, also known as the mother and her daughters. And then of course like in the book of Esther we have the persecuted remnant of God. The remnant of her seed they are called. Also later on in the book of Revelation they are referred to as the 144,000. And finally you have in the end time in the book of Revelation an intercessory figure. That is Jesus Christ who rises in the end time to intercede before His Father for His people and to protect them from annihilation in this union between the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon or the kings of the world. As in the days of Esther, this end time conflict against God's people is simply the last chapter in the long standing controversy between good and evil. I'm going to read several statements from the book The Great Controversy because they're very apropos to what we find in the book of Esther. They describe the repetition in fact of what we find in Esther. In Great Controversy page 581 we find this reference to the end time conflict. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Just like in Esther's day, the conflict began in the days of Saul and ended in the days of Esther, so the final chapter will simply be the culmination of the long-standing controversy between good and evil. 
as in the days of Esther Satan was behind this plot to destroy God's people so in the end time we're told in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ the dragon is behind this end time persecution we also find in the book of Revelation that the issues in the controversy will be God's commandments and worship that's the reason why in the three angels messages you have a constant reference to worship in the first angel's message it says worship the creator the third angel's message says don't worship the beast or his image in other words the end time controversy also has to do with worship it has to do as well with the commandments of God because we're told in Revelation 14 verse 12 here is the patience of the saints here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus also the text that I just referred to Revelation 12 17 it says that the dragon is enraged with the woman and the remnant of her seed because they keep the commandments of God just like in the days of Esther then the issues are going to be the same they are going to be long standing Satan is going to be behind the persecution and the issues particularly are going to be worship and the commandments of God in the end time there will also be a union between church and state between the dragon and the religious powers of the world in fact the political rulers of the world will be led to think that God's people are inimical to the political interests of the nation the political rulers will be duped by the religious leaders to think that they need to get rid of the remnant of God in order to preserve the stability of society and we're told in the book of Revelation that the religious leaders will influence the state to write and enforce legislation that it will be indispensable and necessary to worship on the first day of the week in other words a decree of worship a union of church and state notice Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 and 2 on this union between the civil and the religious power it says then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me come I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters and now notice with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication notice once again the idea that this harlot which represents apostate religion and by the way she has daughters as well because she's the mother in Revelation 17 actually allies herself with the kings of the earth just like happened in the days of Esther now this coalition will actually enforce false worship particularly it will enforce the observance of the first day of the week in violation of the commandments of God notice what we find in Prophets and Kings page 605 Ellen White here sees the connection between the days of Esther and the end time she says today the enemies of the true church see in the little company keeping the Sabbath commandment a Mordecai at the gate the reverence of God's people for His law is a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling on His Sabbath in other words at the end of time the issue once again will be worship whether God's people will be willing to worship on the Sabbath in obedience to God's commandments or whether they will worship on the first day of the week in obedience to the commandments of the civil powers influenced by the religious powers of the world we find also in the book Prophets and Kings page 605 and 606 the following Satan will arouse indignation against the minority who refuse to accept popular customs and traditions men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them do you see there three aspects or three powers so to speak you have the rulers, you have ministers, 
and you have church members, the ministers influencing the members as Haman wanted to influence the whole kingdom against the Jews. Ellen White continues saying, with voice and pen, by boasts, threats, and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, men will stir up the passions of the people, not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack, to secure popularity and patronage, notice this, legislators will ye yield to the demand for Sunday laws, do you see the civil power being influenced by the religious power? She continues saying, but those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue. On this battlefield will be fought the last great conflict in the controversy between truth and error, and we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Today, as in the days of Esther and Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate His truth and His people. So Ellen White makes a definite connection between the days of Esther and Mordecai. As the king, King Ahasuerus, gave a decree that everyone should worship Haman, should bow and reverence him, at the end of time the political powers of the world will give a decree influenced by the religious powers of the world that God's people have to worship on the first day of the week. Interestingly enough, the arguments which will be used against God's people at the end of time will be the same arguments which were used by Haman against God's people. Notice Great Controversy page 592. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Just as Haman said to the king, it's not profitable to keep these people because they'll bring an upheaval to your kingdom. The same argument will be used again. She continues saying, there, that is the remnants, their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused, notice this, of disaffection toward the government. Ministers, here's the religious power, ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained by God in legislative halls and courts of justice. By the way, these are political institutions. Co commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. This is exactly what happened in the days of Esther. She continues saying, a false coloring will be given to their words. The worst construction will be put upon their motives. In Great Controversy page 615 we find this statement. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities, there you have church and state, have combined to enforce observance of the Sunday. See that's the false decree of worship which was given to bow before Haman. She continues saying the persistent refusal of a small minority Remember the words in Esther chapter 3, there's a group of people dispersed, they're small. She continues saying, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and the law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. This is identical to the arguments which were used by Haman before the king about the Jews. And so a death decree will be given against God's people. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15 where this death decree is described. It says he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak 
and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? to be killed and by the way this is the very kingdom who guaranteed civil and religious liberty this beast who has two horns like a lamb just like in the Old Testament we have Medo-Persia represented by a ram a male lamb with two horns this kingdom who has a recognition of two kingdoms the kingdom of God which is the church and the kingdom of politics which is the civil power will actually be united and God's people will lose their liberty and will be persecuted now the characteristics of the death decree at the end of time are going to be very similar to the characteristics of the death decree in the days of Esther I want you to notice Daniel chapter 11 verses 44 and 45 where it's speaking about the king of the north now the king of the north here is parallel to Haman and I want you to notice how this king of the north goes out to try and destroy God's people and in a few moments we're going to go to Daniel chapter 12 you're going to see the connection even clearer with the book of Esther it says there in Daniel 11:44, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him that is the king of the north therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many so notice the king of the north which is parallel to Haman is going to go out with great wrath to try and destroy and annihilate the people of God when we read Daniel 12 and verse 1 the very next verse we're going to notice that the target of this enmity is God's people Ellen White in Prophets and Kings page 605 says this about the end time death decree she says the decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews notice the end time death decree is going to be very similar to the death decree in the days of Esther we're going to notice several parallels now in some statements that we find in the book The Great Controversy we're going to find that the end time death decree will be solicited by the religious powers from the political powers in other words the religious powers will influence the state to give this death decree secondly this death decree will be written in the third place this death decree will be dated in the fourth place this death decree will be universal in the fifth place there will appear to be no escape from this death decree and in the sixth place everyone will be told to be ready for the time when the date arrives to execute the death decree now allow me to read you several statements here from the spirit of prophecy on this point great controversy page 616 Ellen White says this this argument that is the argument that it's not good to keep God's people around because they'll cause all sorts of problems in society she says this argument will appear conclusive and a decree will, be, will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death Great Controversy page 631 is even more specific she says though a general decree has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be put to death their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will endeavor to take their lives do you see that this death decree is going to have a specific date in it just like in the days of Esther we find also in Great Controversy page 635 these words when the protection of human laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God there will be in different lands, notice it's universal, a simultaneous movement for their destruction. As the time appointed in the decree, notice that, as the time appointed in the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow which will utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof finally in Great Controversy page 618 
Satan numbers the world as his subjects. But the little company who keep the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. Just like in the days of Esther, Haman wanted to obliterate every single Jew. At the end of time, the devil is going to want to blot out every single spiritual Jew who is linked to Jesus Christ. Now when the death decree comes, there will be a terrible time of trouble which will ensue. Interestingly enough, immediately after we're told in Daniel 11 verse 44 and 45 that the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate many, Daniel 12 and verse 1 has these words. The very next verse. This shows that the king of the north is targeting God's faithful people. It says in Daniel 12 and verse 1, At that time, when the king of the north goes to destroy God's people, Michael shall what? Michael shall stand up. That's just like Esther standing up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be what? And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Notice that when the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate God's people, we're told here that there will be a time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. Ellen White, amplifying this time of trouble, in Great Controversy, page 616, says this, The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Notice that God's people once again will cry out in agony and in pain, thinking that perhaps God has forsaken them in the hands of their enemies. Also we find in Great Controversy, page 635, these words, The people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forests and the mountains, still plead for divine protection, while in every quarter companies of armed men urged on by hosts of evil angels, are preparing for the work of death. It is now, in the hour of utmost extremity, that, God, that the God of Israel will interpose for the deliverance of His saints. It's interesting to notice that in the end time, the political and the religious power will drink wine together. But this time it is not literal wine of the Ernest and Julio Gallo type, but the wine becomes symbolic of false doctrines or false teachings. Notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. It says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And now notice, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Notice the comments of Ellen White about this wine in Testimonies to Ministers, pages 60 and 61. You remember in the days of Esther, the king and the religious figure sat down to drink wine together. This is one of the reasons why the king could not think straight. Now notice what Ellen White has to say about the meaning of the wine in the end time. She says, the fallen denominational churches are Babylon. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. This wine of error is made up of false doctrines, such as the natural immortality of the soul, the eternal torment of the wicked, the denial of the pre-existence of Christ prior to His birth in Bethlehem, and advocating and exalting the first day of the week above God's holy and sanctified day. These and kindred errors are presented to the world by the various churches, And thus the scriptures are fulfilled that say, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
it is a wrath which is created by false doctrines and when kings and presidents drink this wine of the wrath of her fornication they are stirred with anger against those who will not come into harmony with the false and satanic heresies which exalt the false Sabbath and lead men to trample underfoot God's memorial. Did you notice that the kings and the presidents are the ones who drink the wine and as a result they're filled with wrath against God's people? This is identical to what happened in the days of Esther. Now do you remember the opening of the books in the days of Esther? Let me ask you, is there going to be an opening of the books before probation closes to reveal the reward of God's people before that they, they are actually rewarded? Is it going to be shown that God's people serve the king and love the king even at the risk of their lives? Absolutely. Notice Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7 speaks about this pre-advent judgment before God's people receive the reward. Their cases are examined. It says there, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel, gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment, what? has come and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This pre-advent judgment will reveal that God's people have served the heavenly King and yet they have not been rewarded yet but the books will show their reward they will wear the king's crown they will wear the king's robe and they will sit on the king's horse so to speak and they will be paraded before their enemies which will fall at their feet according to Revelation chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10 and then of course Jesus will come and actually reward his people like Mordecai was rewarded after his records were examined in fact notice Revelation 22 and verse 12 on this reward it says Jesus is speaking and behold I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work now let me ask you is Jesus going to change his garments before he actually comes back to this earth to deliver his people yes he is how is Jesus garbed today in heaven Jesus now is garbed as high priest the book of Hebrews makes it very clear in other words Jesus has the attire of a high priest notice Hebrews 4 and verse 14 on this point seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the Son of God let us hold fast our confession clearly it says here that Jesus now is the high priest but interestingly enough when Jesus comes again he will come garbed as a king he will have placed his kingly robes on just like Esther changed when she went to intercede for her people notice Revelation chapter 19 verses 11, 12 and 16 it says now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords when Jesus comes he comes dressed as a king now he's dressed as a priest which means that he must change at some point before his coming it's interesting to notice in this light what Ellen White says in early writings page 281 then I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with his most kingly robes upon his head were many crowns a crown within a crown surrounded by the angelic host he left heaven so notice that Jesus is also going to change his robes by the way do you know what the name Esther means? in Hebrew Esther means star and in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16 Jesus is called the bright and morning star as Esther stepped to the plate to defend her next of a kin from annihilation so Jesus when God's people are under the death decree will stand up as Michael to defend his people from their enemies 
Notice Daniel 12 and verse 1 once again. It says at that time, during this time of terrible trouble, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. See, he's the defender of God's people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. You see, Jesus is our next of kin. He's our close relative. He went to the cross, and He was willing to say, I am going to give my life for my people, and if it means perishing forever, and being forever separated from my Father, if I perish, I perish. But I love my people, and I will not allow my people to be destroyed. Notice what Ellen White has to say, Great Controversy, pages 635 and 36. Speaking about the wicked surrounding God's people to destroy them, she says, with shouts of triumph, jeering, and imprecation, throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey, when lo, a dense blackness deeper than the darkness of the night falls upon the earth. Then a rainbow shining with the glory from the throne of God spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company. Notice this, the angry multitudes are suddenly arrested, their mocking cries die away, the objects of their murderous rage are forgotten, with fearful forebodings they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from its overpowering brightness. By the people of God a clear voice, a clear and melodious voice is heard saying, look up! and lifting their eyes to the heavens they behold the bow of promise the black angry clouds that covered the firmament are parted and like Stephen they look up steadfastly into heaven and see the glory of God and the Son of Man seated upon the throne in his divine form they discern, they discern the mark of his, marks of his humiliation and from his lips they hear the request presented before his father and the holy angels I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. In other words he's going to say, Father intervene so that my people are not destroyed, so that they are delivered from their enemies. It's interesting to notice how God's people are going to be delivered by God. Do you remember that in the story in the book of Esther, the rage of the king was focused on God's people because of the work of his religious advisor. But suddenly the plot was unmasked and now the wrath of the king instead of being directed against God's people was now directed against the religious advisor who had prepared the plot. Do you know that the book of Revelation says that the kings of the earth will eventually turn upon the religious system who deceived them? Notice what we find in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 16. Revelation 17 verse 16. It's speaking about ten horns who represent ten kings, and the number ten represents the kings of the earth and the whole world. It says there, and the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, and make her desolate, and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. The harlot had been seated on them before. Revelation 17 says that the harlot had used these kings. She had actually sat on the heads and she'd used these horns to persecute God's people. Now suddenly these horns, the kings of the earth and the whole world, remove their support from her and they actually arise to annihilate her instead of destroying the people of God. Ellen White describes this moment in future history in Great Controversy 655 and 56. This is a spectacular description. She says the people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction. But all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Remember Haman? Now the, the king is angry with Haman. She continues saying unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in the, their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry. 
and you are the cause of our ruin and they turn upon the false shepherds the very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them the very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction whereas up to that point the wicked under the influence of this religious power influencing the state wanted to destroy God's people now the political powers of the world turn on this apostate religious system which has deceived them it's interesting that many of the wicked will want to have Jesus intercede for them at this point because they will find themselves without shelter in great controversy page 627 we find these words speaking about the wicked and their death decree against God's people by condemning the people of God to death they have as truly incurred the guilt of their blood as if it had been shed by their hands in like manner Christ declared the Jews of his time guilty of all the blood of holy men which had been shed since the days of Abel for they possessed the same spirit and were seeking to do the same work with these murderers of the prophets in a very incisive statement Ellen White in Spiritual Gifts volume 1 page 199 has this to say about many of the wicked during this time of trouble when they see that they're really lost that they've been fighting against God they're going to seek somehow for the saints to intercede for them as Haman wanted Esther to intercede for him but they're going to say probation is closed by marking God's people for destruction there is no longer any, any intercession notice this statement spiritual gifts volume 1 page 199 she says the plagues were falling upon the inhabitants of the earth some were denouncing God and cursing him others rushed to the people of God and begged to be taught how they should escape the judgments of God but the saints had nothing for them the last tear for sinners had been shed the last agonizing prayer offered the last burden had been borne the sweet voice of mercy was no more to invite them the last note of warning had been given when the saints in all heaven were interested for their salvation they had no interest for themselves life and death had been set before them many desired life but did not make any effort to obtain it they did not choose life and now there was no atoning blood to cleanse the sinner no compassionate savior to plead for them and cry spare spare the sinner a little longer all heaven had united with Jesus as they heard the fearful words it is done it is finished the plan of salvation had been accomplished and as mercy's sweet voice died away a fearfulness and horror seized them with terrible distinctness they hear too late, too late that was the experience of Haman who wanted Esther to intercede for him but it was too late because he had plotted the destruction of the Jews it's interesting to notice that the wicked will die with the very weapons that they intended to use on God's people Great Controversy page 655 we find this very interesting statement Ellen White says the swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies everywhere there is strife and bloodshed just like in the days of Haman Haman died in the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai and the gallows were used to destroy him in the end of time the weapons prepared against God's people will actually be turned upon those who prepared the plot to destroy God's people as in the days of Esther the angels of God will take the battlefield in favor of God's people notice Revelation chapter 19 and verse 14 speaking about the coming of Christ it says and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him that is followed Jesus on white horses Psalm 91 verses 10 and 11 we find these words no evil shall befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways in great controversy page 631 once again we find the protecting power of God through the ministration of the angels though a general decree has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be put to death 
their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will endeavor to take their lives but none can pass the mighty guardians stationed about every faithful soul some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages but the swords raised against them break and fall powerless as straw others are defended by angels in the form of men of war early writings page 284 we find this statement as the saints left the cities and villages they were pursued by the wicked who sought to slay them but the swords that were raised to kill God's people broke and fell as powerless as straw angels of God shielded the saints as they cried day and night for deliverance their cry came up before the Lord one final statement in the book Last Day Events page 251 Ellen White says the battle of Armageddon is soon to be fought he on whose vesture is written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords leads forth the armies of heaven on white horses clothed in fine linen clean and white at the end of time the angels of God will take the battlefield just like in the days of Esther and then of course will come the great celebration in the heavenly kingdom that great banquet that table which is many miles in length where God's people will sit and Jesus him, Christ himself will come and serve them the marriage supper of the Lamb if you please a time of joy and happiness and deliverance notice Revelation chapter 19 and verses 5 through 9 on this specific point then a voice came from the throne saying praise our God all you his servants and those who fear him both small and great and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings saying Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigns let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints then he said to me write blessed are those who ca are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb and he said to me these are the true sayings of God notice the great celebration after the deliverance the great banquet table the marriage supper of the Lamb where God's people have been turned from sadness and from sorrow and from anguish and from destruction into deliverance and joy and peace and gladness now what about in the book of Esther where you find the absence of God do you know that during this severe time of trouble God's people are going to start wondering whether God is even around anymore do you know that the wicked are actually going to say to God's people where is your faith now where is your God now your God is absent but what they don't realize is that God has been acting from within human history not in a spectacular way but has been working in an invisible way providentially through the end time events to lead eventually to the deliverance of his people notice great controversy page 630 great controversy page 630 yet to human sight it will appear that the people of God must soon seal their testimony with their blood as did the martyrs before them see they say we're going to be martyred we're going to be killed just like the previous martyrs she continues saying they themselves begin to fear that the Lord has left them to fall by the hand of their enemies it is a time of fearful agony day and night they cry unto God for deliverance the wicked exult and the jeering cry is heard where now is your faith why does not God deliver you out of our hands if you are indeed his people so once again it will appear like God is absent from human history 
when all of the powers of the earth, the religious powers, the political powers of the world all gather together to slay the remnant who keep the commandments of God, who worship God, who fear God, who would rather obey God and die than be disobedient to His will, these individuals will begin to wonder whether God has forsaken them because they can't really see God intervening and working within history but of course their deliverance will be as spectacular as it was in the days of Esther now I would like to bring this to a close by asking a question why did God give us the book of Esther? Did he give us the book of Esther simply because it was a spectacular story about a deliverance that took place in the Old Testament when the Jews were marked for destruction? Is it merely a historical record of historical events? Or does this book have a prophetic dimension? Is it really delineating what is going to happen step after step at the end of time? I believe that when we look at the book of Revelation and we study the book Great Controversy we can clearly see that the book of Esther is really a choreography of end time events. Everything is there. The enemies of God's people, the time of trouble, the decree, decree to worship, the death decree, all of the characteristics are the same the wicked surrounding God's people, the issue of worship and the commandments of God, the same enemies and the same way in which God is going to deliver His people, the intervention of the angels, everything is found in the book of Esther. Now the question is, why would God give us end time prophetic events by telling a story? I believe that the reason is very clear. You see people read the book of Revelation, and the book of Revelation is presented in symbols. And the symbols have to be deciphered. In other words, you have to decode them. You have to discover what the symbols mean. And for that you have to go to different places of the Bible, uh, you know, to interpret what the beast represents, and what the false prophet represents, and what the dragon represents, and what the seal of God is, and what the mark of the beast is. Those are all symbolic. And so what we have to do is we have to discover what the symbolic language means. We have to decode it. But the beauty of the book of Esther is the fact that what is symbolic in Revelation is presented in story form in the book of Esther. And so the book of Esther simply decodes Revelation. It shows us how the symbols of Revelation are going to pan out in human history. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It's like many other stories in the book of Genesis and also in the book of Daniel. You have for example the story in Daniel chapter 3 where the three young men stand before the image which Nebuchadnezzar has raised up and by the way Nebuchadnezzar for a while lived as a beast and so he raises his image and he gives a command that everybody should worship the image which he has raised up and he says whoever does not worship the image that I the beast have made is going to be killed and there's three young men that say we obey God's law and God's law says that we're not supposed to worship any images we obey God's commandments, not the civil power's commandments, when they conflict with the commandments of God. And therefore the king says, okay, if that's the case, I'm going to throw you in the oven, and you're going to be killed. And they said, well, we don't know if God is going to deliver us or not. If He doesn't choose to deliver us, that's fine. If He choose to, chooses to deliver us, that's fine too. But either way, we are not going to bow before your image. And then of course we all know the story. The three young men were thrown into the fiery furnace. Were they delivered? Several times in Daniel chapter 3 you, three, you find the word deliver directly used to refer to these three young men. In fact the story tells us that uh, suddenly the king looked and he saw inside the furnace not three men but four men. And they were walking like in a garden. And Nebuchadnezzar says to his assistants, did we throw three men into the furnace? Why is it that I see four walking around in the furnace, and the fourth is like unto the Son of God? Now let me tell you, let me ask you this question. Do you think that that story illustrates in a beautiful way the symbols of Revelation chapter 13? Of course it does. You don't have to decode anything, because you have a story. 
You have all of the elements of the story that we find in Revelation, but in a decoded form, in a deciphered form. You know how the end time crisis is going to take place. And at the end of the book of Daniel we find Michael standing up. When God's people are going to be destroyed, Michael stands up to deliver his people, everyone who is found written in the book. Now I'd like to read a statement that we find in Christian Experience and Teaching of Ellen White, page 204. Here she tells us how important history is. You see one of the big problems that we have in the world today is that people have forgotten history. People don't want to read history because they think it's boring. But you know if we don't read history, if we don't know what happened in history, we're going to repeat the same mistakes of history. You know people today misinterpret Bible prophecy and the reason why is because they don't know the historical background of Bible prophecy. Now notice this statement. Ellen White says this, speaking about the history of the Adventist church. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. And then she says this, these are very famous words, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. Another reason why God gives us stories besides decoding the symbols of Revelation in the stories is because as we look at the stories we can see God's deliverance in history. And God is trying to tell us, listen, when in Esther's day my people were marked for destruction, what did I do? And of course our answer is, well Lord, you intervened in a miraculous way under the surface, not spectacularly, you were there all the time, though we couldn't feel you, we couldn't see you, and you delivered them. And then God says to us, and, and do you think I'm going to do it sometime again? If I did it in the past, do you think I'm going to do it in the future? Of course. So God has given us the, the benefit of history so that we can know that as He acted in the past, He will act in the future. We can take it to the bank. As we look at history, we know what God is going to do in prophecy. As we look at the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3, or the throwing of Daniel into the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6, we see that God delivers those who are faithful to Him. In fact, I don't know whether you've noticed this, but in Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6 we have illustrated the first two clauses of the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The first part of the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And then the second clause says or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Basically what the First Amendment does, it says to Congress which makes the laws in this country, you cannot establish any religious observance. And secondly, you cannot forbid people from practicing their religion. You can't establish it and you can't forbid it. In Daniel chapter 3 we have an illustration of the government establishing religion. Because Nebuchadnezzar raises the image and he says, he says you have to worship this way. And they say, no we don't. We worship God. We keep God's commandments. And so there you have the establishment clause. The, establishment, the civil power establishing religion, commanding people to worship in a certain way. But in Daniel chapter 6 we have the other side of the coin, the second clause of the First Amendment. You see in Daniel chapter 6 the king forbids Daniel from worshiping in a certain way, from worshiping his God during a period of 30 days. In other words, he's forbidding the free exercise of religion. He's not establishing religion, he's forbidding Daniel from exercising his own religion. And so when the king says you can't worship this way, Daniel says yes I can, I obey the commandments of God, I worship God, and I obey the civil power as long as it does not interfere in my relationship with God. And so God intervenes and He delivers those who are faithful to Him in not accepting the establishment of religion or accepting the prohibition of the free exercise of religion. Are you understanding what I'm saying? In other words, 
This first amendment of the Constitution of the United States was established as a divine principle within the Constitution of the United States, within the Bill of Rights. It's not a mere human creation. It's really two kingdoms in one. In this nation we have only one nation, but it's a recognition of two kingdoms separate one from the other. We have the civil power which is also in the first amendment, and we have the religious power separated from one another. And Congress cannot make a law establishing religion, and Congress cannot make a law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The end time crisis folks is not going to be over the oil of the Middle East. The end time crisis is not going to be a battle between Arabs and Jews. It's not going to be the Russians coming against literal Israel. The final battle is going to be the same type of battle as in the days of Esther. The issues are going to be who do you worship and whom do you obey? Will you obey the civil powers of the world used by the religious powers or will you obey God and His law? We must come to the answer that was given on the day of Pentecost by Peter shortly after the day of Pentecost. He says it is more necessary to obey God than men. Now I'm not saying that we shouldn't obey the civil power. We certainly should obey the civil power as long as the civil power does not overstep its bounds and start legislating religious observances and start forbidding the free exercise of our religion. So folks the story of Esther is going to be reenacted once again. But it is going to be reenacted on a worldwide global scale. The issues will be the same but on a global scale. With spiritual Israel. With symbolic worldwide enemies. And yet the end result will be the same. God's people no longer in little Medo Persia but God for His people on all of planet earth will intervene and He will deliver His people everyone who has His or her name written in the book.